Hi, I'm Stephen Winstonley, your presenter for this overview of marine identification, taxonomy and classification. I have been a diver for many years and in the early years diving for me, and I suspect many of you, was to observe the underwater world of wrecks, reefs, plants and animals. For the last few years, I have been diving with a purpose to understand, rather than just observe, this undersea world. So a few years ago, I wanted to rejuvenate my diving, so I decided to learn more about the underwater environment and the critters that live there. The challenge was simply learning by rote is that there is lots of critters and the problem space too large to, to consume and the method of learning too boring. I needed to break the problem space down into manageable chunks. My first lecture expressed my learnings in the areas of geology, seabeds and habitats and hopefully gave an insight into where the critters live within the undersea world. This lecture examines the critters themselves, so from the subset of habitats that I dive regularly in the temperate green waters of the UK, I wanted to categorise critters so that when I look at the seabed I can use taxonomical decision trees to identify what I am likely seeing. This lecture allows me to focus on the types of plant, chromista and animal life that live around the UK waters. I should, um, I should also note, however, I'm a purely recreational diver with an interest in marine life and not an expert marine geologist or biologist. The UK waters are abundant with marine life and can be as interesting, if not more so, than such places like the Red Sea. Temperate green water diving, as the name suggests, means the water is cold but full of phytoplankton. Due to this green pigment, chlorophyll, it absorbs the red and blue portions of the light spectrum, meaning that conditions deeper in a chlorophyll environment are poorer, making diving darker. However, phytoplankton is the start of the food chain, and where there is the right balance of it, you can find many other species. Blue water diving is lacking in this phytoplankton and can be considered less life sustaining. So what are our objectives in this presentation? We're aiming to be a knowledge builder from the BZAC Marine Life Appreciation course to be able to offer an understanding of why we classify, examine the history of taxonomy and classification, and show how taxonomy and classification works. We're then going to develop the broader classification at the phylum level for the marine environment. We will work down to the detailed classification of animals to the level of orders with examples, followed by working through detailed classification of plants and chromisters to the level of phylum with examples. The aim would be to develop a better understanding of what we see when we go diving and to allow you to develop more interests so that you become more ecologically aware. Finally, I'll look at the next steps, which is marine identification at the level of the individual species. At the end of this presentation, I would like to give you a level of knowledge so that you can pick up a marine identification book or access an online marine identification resource and know where to start. Why classify species? I would now like to introduce you to the scientific naming of species. Common names are user friendly but are imprecise and ambiguous. One species can have many common names. One common name can refer to several species. However, scientific names are always unique. So let's have a look at one animal. This species has the scientific name Gadus mora lineus, which can have several common names. It can be called the Atlantic cod, Cody cod, Blodak rud, Red knock, 
black codling. So in the UK, we refer to this fish simply as a cod. However, the name cod is used around the world to refer to different species, the species depending on the country you are present. History of classification and taxonomy so far. The history of classification and taxonomy going from left to right in the table. You may have played the game, is it animal, vegetable or mineral, when you were a child. This is the world by Linnaeus in 1735, where he had two living kingdoms. Heinkel in 1866 introduced the category of protista and at the time meant single-celled organisms such as protozoa, simple algae, fungi, and slime moles. Chatton in 25 believed there should be a level above kingdoms called empires and created procryota and eukryota empires. Further in 1938, Kuppen clarifies the kingdom boundaries within the empires with the definition of monera. Monera are unicellular organisms that have no nuclear membrane, such as bacteria. Whitaker in 1969 split the plant kingdoms into plant and fungi. The main difference between plant and fungi is that fungi have chitin as a component of the cell walls instead of cellulose and a further difference is the presence of chlorophyll in plants and not in fungi, meaning that fungi are parasites gaining their energy typically from dead and decaying matter. Wu et al had done some research to define some new kingdoms within the bacteria world and we are not going to progress this field in this particular talk. Also Wu et al in 1990 moved the Chatton two empires into three domains. In 1993 an important development in the classification of marine species was made by Cavalier Smith and separated some of the species into a new plant-like class called Chromistas. We will expand on this kingdom later in the presentation. In 1998, Cavalier and Smith reduced those eight kingdoms to six. However, Ruggieri et al. in 2015 reinstated one of the kingdoms, so the current thinking is seven kingdoms on planet Earth. Of all those kingdoms, we are only considering a few of those going forward in this presentation, and this will be the kingdom of Chromista, Plantae and Animalia. It will not consider unicellular species like bacteria, archaea or protozoa. I will also not consider fungus, even though there are plenty of fungi in the marine environment of which 440 species have been discovered. And it is suggested that this is less than 1% of the fungus that lives in our oceans. So we can see that this subject is very dyna dynamic and it is being defined all the time. And with the advent of DNA, there is much reclassification presently being performed. I draw your attention to the picture on the bottom right hand corner where we can see over the millennia as evidenced by DNA mapping, an impression of how evolution on planet Earth occurred. The study in the evolution of species has suggested that in the beginning, the bacteria and archaea are the early forms of life. From these early forms, they combine to introduce the protistas, and from them, uh, we then involve the more complex branches of plant, chromista, fungi, and animals. Taxonomy and classification, how it works at the high level. 
Taxonomy and classification in at the deep end. A few slides ago we talked about the scientific name being unique. So if I draw your attention to example one and we go to the bottom of the table to the row of species, we can see the label H. sapiens. That is Homo sapiens, which is the unique scientific name for humans, the common name. We have uniquely labelled ourselves as Homo sapiens. However, when we look at this particular column, we can see that we also belong to other broader groups of classification. So looking at example one again, we go up this chain of descriptors, we can see that Homo sapiens belongs to primates and primates belong to mammalia or mammals. We know that, for example, dolphins are mammals, but they are not primates. And we can then go to the phylum slightly higher up to say humans are in the classification chordata. Chordata simply means a group with a notochord or backbone. Dolphins and humans have a backbone and we can say all mammals belong to the phylum chordata. We can say all members of chordata are members of the kingdom of animalia. All animalia belong to the domain eukarya which are organisms whose cells contain a nucleus surrounded by a membrane. And all organisms like plants, animals, fungi and chromistas also belong to this classification. And so we, <clears throat> what we are now seeing is a sort of upside down tree structure with a very broad and wide descriptor at the top to something that is very detailed and unique at the bottom. So the difference between taxonomy and classification is effectively taxonomy is the column and classification is the row. In other words, the fundamental difference is that the taxonomy describes the differences between organisms, while classification describes the similarities between organisms. Taxonomy and classification in action. In this table, we are discussing how taxonomy and classification works. We have got the domains on the top, which are very broad descriptors. By using the taxonomic orders, we can break the domains down into kingdoms, phylum, classes, orders, family, genia, and species. What we're doing is categorizing or classifying each of the different layers into finer and finer details in order to be able to get to a single scientific name of the species at the bottom and hence to develop accurately a tree of life. So let's have a look at these examples. Example one, we already know what it is. It's the Homo sapiens as previously discussed. Looking at the classification, we can determine that Homo sapiens are eukarya that is an organism made up of cells with nuclei. Homo sapiens are animals as they feed, breathe, move and reproduce. Homo sapiens have a backbone as they are grouped as chordata. Homo sapiens are mammals as they are warm blooded and produce living young. Homo sapiens are primates as we have a simple twisted nose. So all those attributes are all true for Homo sapiens. So let's reveal a Homo sapien. In example two, if we can work our way down this particular list, we can see that it is an animal and not a plant. It's got a backbone. It's a chondrichthys, which basically means it's got a skeleton of cartilage and not of calcium. Laminadi for its order and family, therefore it is not a squalus, i.e. of the cat shark family. And you may be able to recognise some familiar terms of the genius Carcaridon 
and the species Carcharodon carcaris. And if you're familiar with the film Jaws, then you'll recognize a species here, which of course has a common name of the great white shark. Example three. This species of the domain Eucaria, and it is in the kingdom of Animalia. The species has a backbone as it is in the phylum Chordata. It has a class Actinopterygii, which basically means it's a ray finned fish and not a lobed finned fish. Also, it has the order of Signathiform, which translates to having a narrow body surrounded by a series of bony rings with a small tubular mouth. And as we've got a genius of Hippocampus and a unique species name of Hippocampus guttulatus, it has the common name of the long-snouted seahorse. And if it was of the species Hippocampus hippocampus, then it would have been the short-snouted seahorse. Example four, briefly. Again, we're looking at the family of Animalia. It's a mollusca with a class bivalvia. So I'm considering it could possibly be a muscular footed shell type creature. So this particular one is of the order Pectinida, which describes a large saltwater clam from the family Pectinidae, which is related to the oyster and scallop, and species Pectin maximus, and has in fact a common name of great or king scallop. Example five. When we look down the column, we can see that it is very similar to example three. So it must have a body surrounded by a series of bony rings and small tubular mouth. It's also from the family Signathidae and species Signa Signathius acus. So you can guess that the species is in the area of a seahorse, but not quite a seahorse. So then what is it? Actually, you may have seen it many times lying on the bottom in UK waters, as the common name is a pipe fish. And in our last example in this table, we've got a Eucraria and Animalia. It's a mollusca, but it is now a cephalopod and not a bivalve. And it's of the order of Sepida, a family Sepidae, and a genius Sepia. Now you may recall Sepia is an ink, and a long time ago one used to use Sepia ink to make drawings in the early part of the 14th century. Sepia ink was taken from cucklefish. So Sepia officinalis is a Cucklefish. Three domain classifications. When looking at the top row in the previous table, we see the label domain. There are only three classifications of domain in the taxonomical tree of life. These domains are firstly, Eukarya which are organisms whose cells have a nucleus enclosed within a membrane. This includes protozoans, plants, chromistas, fungi, and animals. The second domain is bacteria. They constitute a large domain of unicellular biological microorganisms. They are typically a few millimetres in length. Bacteria have a number of shapes ranging from spheres to rods and spirals. The third domain is Archaea. 
these microorganisms are usually unicellular. They have no nucleus. Archaea have very different shapes, such as flat and square cells. They can live in harsh environments, such as hot springs and very dense salt lakes, where no other organisms can live. Eukarya Kingdom classifications. From the three domains, we'll only be considering the Eukarya domain because the other domains we cannot see with the naked eye. The next level down in granularity within the taxonomy tree is kingdoms. Therefore, we'll only consider the kingdoms within the Eukarya domain. Looking at the table of kingdoms in the Eukarya domain, we will not consider the kingdom protozoans. Protozoans are one-celled animals, either free-living or parasitic, which often possess animal-like behaviours. We will consider some chromistas. The chromistas such as brown algae that contain chlorophyllis A and C and do not store their energy in the form of starch. The kingdom of plants includes flowering plants, conifers and other gymnosperms, ferns, hogwarts, liverworts and mosses, but we will only consider some plants like green and red algae, as well as underwater grasses. We will not consider fungi, even though there are fungi in the marine environment. Fungi by definition acquire their food by absorbing dissolved molecules typically by secreting digestive enzymes in their environment. Fungi do not photosynthesize. We will be considering animalia that basically consume organic material, breathe oxygen, move, reproduce and grow from hollow spheres of cells called bastulas. Eukarya Kingdoms Phylum. In the previous slides, I have been comprehensive in my description of the groups of classification. Unfortunately, life on Earth is so complex that describing every level of classification is not feasible. So what I will be doing is being very selective with the types of species that I will be classifying. Therefore, I will be concentrating on the classes visible in the marine environment and looking at examples of species found in temperate waters around the UK. So within the five kingdoms belonging to the domain Eukarya, we can increase the granularity of classification by moving down one level of detail. This next level of grouping is called a phylum. In the Protozoa Kingdom, we have 20 phylum. In the Chromista Kingdom, we have 16 phylum, and some are very significant within the marine environment, like common seaweed such as kelp, bladderwrack, and fur bellows. We also have the Plant Kingdom. There are 13 phylum. And to note, there are only 350,000 species of plant that have been described in science. One may have logically imagined that there are far more plants than animals in existence, but it is in fact the other way around. In the fungi kingdom, there are eight phylum. The animal kingdom has 34 phylum, and science has actually described 1,525,000 species known to science, which is about three and a half times more animal species than plants. To start describing all the phylum, followed by all the classes, orders, family, genii and species, will take us forever. And so we'll now be very selective on which parts of the tree of life we are following. Broad classification, phylums. 
Eukarya Animalia Phylum. I would like to break down the domain Eukarya using taxonomy and classification tables. I will start to put some common names we use to describe critters into the taxonomical buckets. The animal kingdom in the left column is expanded to the next level of detail. I have listed phylum in the centre column that covers all animal species in the UK marine environment. If we look in the phylum column, we can start with arthropods. Arthropods are invertebrate animals that have an exoskeleton, a segmented body and purred jointed limbs. This phylum includes insects, arachnids and crustaceans. Bryozoans are common and can be seen on almost every sea dive, but few divers will be able to point to them and many believe they are plants. Bryozoa or moss animals are a phylum of simple aquatic invertebrate animals, nearly all living in static colonies. Typically the zooids are about half a millimetre long. They have a special feeding structure called a lophophore or crown of tentacles used for filter feeding. These animal colonies can create some very large structures. Chordata. Previously we talked about some of the animals having a backbone or more accurately a notochord. There are two subphalums of chordata of interest. These are the tourniquets and the vertebrates. Within the kingdom of Animalia we have Nadaria. This word is a silent letter C. This is an interesting phylum because these are a collection of things that sting. Nadarians mostly have two basic body forms, a sessile polyps or swimming meduse, both of which are radially symmetrical with mouths surrounded by stinging tentacles. Senatophora or comb jellyfish which are not jellyfish despite of the name. The comb jellyfish are those transparent, delicate, egg-shaped animals that have fine hairs or cilla that split the light into rainbow colours. You often see these senatophores on deco stops drifting by in the warm summer months. Incaniderms. Incaniderms exhibit a great diversity of body forms. Although all incaniderms have five part radial symmetry, an internal skeleton, and a water vascular system derived from a central cavity, the general appearance ranges that from the stemmed flower like sea lilies to worm like burrowing sea cucumbers to heavily armoured intertidal starfish or sea urchins. Mollusca is a large and diverse classification. The three most universal features defined in mollusks are one, a mantle or cloak with a cavity used for breathing and excretion. Two, the presence of a radula, which is a rasp-like tongue, but note, Bivalves use silica to flick their food and do not have a tongue. 3. And a mollusk has a nervous system. Worms are actually a vast group of phylum and are incredibly interesting. We have a little as two species of platyheliminthes or flatworm in the UK. We have only a few species of nemati or ribbon worms and the majority of worms are annelids or segmented worms which can look quite different. Porifera 
or sponges are grouped within the animal kingdom and contain many subclasses of taxonomy. They are multicellular organisms that have bodies full of pores and channels, allowing water to circulate through them. Sponges do not have nerves, digestive systems or circulatory systems. Instead, they mostly rely on maintaining a constant water flow through their bodies to obtain food and oxygen and to remove waste. Plantate and Chromista. Having talked about the animal kingdom, we are now going to progress into the world of seaweed. The term seaweed is a collective name for macroscopic marine algae that belong to three groups, red, brown and green, and which live on the seashore and in the shallow seas throughout the world. Seaweed are important primary producers and they constitute a habitat for a wide range of intertidal and subtidal animals. Chromista specifically is a complex kingdom that includes species whose cells contain chlorophyll C to process light into energy. But the kingdom of Chromista also includes parasites like the malaria parasite. Seaweeds are best categorized and identified based upon the visual appearance. As closely related taxonomical species may appear very different. So to group them together in strict taxonomic order would be confusing to a non-specialist. In addition, in the UK, we have a couple of species of marine grass, which are included in the kingdom of plantae. It is noted grass are not classed as seaweed or algae. We are going to keep the classification relatively high within the different kingdoms of plantae and chromista, and I will describe the phylum later in the presentation. Detailed classification of animals to the level of order. Eucharia animalia arthropods. Arthropods is a large phylum containing many of the crawling insects. One of the subphylums is Crustacea. Crustaceans are split into two classes, Malacostraca, which have an order called decapods, meaning they have got 10 appendages, of which two appendages are formed pincers, which include crab, lobster, prawn and shrimp. But we also have within the subphylum of crustaceans, hexanuplia, and an order called theocostraca, which include barnacles. Theocostraca has about 1,320 described species, so we can now start to group barnacles to crabs and lobsters as there is a common subphylum. We also have underwater spiders in the UK, and you may have thought they are closely related to decapods having lots of legs. They're actually in a different subphylum altogether, and so they're not closely related. We can also see in this table the subphylum of Cholicrata, where we have horseshoe crabs, which is not a UK species. So we can see that a common naming label describes a species wrongly. The UK sea spiders belong to the class Pisinogonidia. Arthropoda crustacea. In the top two rows, we have some decapods, with the upper row being invasive species to the UK. At the top left, we see the head of two lobsters. The first is the American lobster, and the second is the native European lobster. The American lobster is imported live into the UK for use in restaurants. However, some have been released into UK waters, creating pockets of invasive species.
If you should see an American lobster, female or not, it should be recovered from the water. Top centre we have a Japanese skeleton shrimp which grows to about 5 cm in length and it is an aggressive and now highly competitive invasive species outcompeting the native UK shrimp. It is in the top five destructive alien species in the UK. Top right is an invasive Chinese mitten crab and there is a website dedicated to mitten crab monitoring by the Marine Biological Association Recording Scheme who are requesting sightings. Middle left we have the crawfish or spiny lobster and it has been classified as a priority species under the UK 2010 Biodiversity Framework and is listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. In the centre we have the snapping prawn and to the right is the common or serrated prawn in the middle rows. On the bottom left we have uh, two pictures of Theocostra or barnacles. Adna angelicum is a parasitic barnacle where it attaches to the coral's uh, cal calcareous skeleton. It is found mainly on the Devonshire cup coral and is been seen on 30 to 50 percent of corals in the southwest UK. You might be able to just see it on the base of the cup coral on the picture to the bottom left. To the bottom middle is a picture of what we commonly see as a barnacle, but identification of the many barnacle species is quite difficult without closely examining the amount of side plates and the mouth formations. And to the bottom right we have the Pisonogonidia or sea, cry, sea spider, uh, and this one is called a gangly lancer. Eucaria animalia bryozoa. Bryozoas are commonly called moss animals. Their zooids are half a millimetre in size, but they congregate to form multicellular structures, forming a much larger colonial animal. The zooids are typically filter feeders with retractable tentacles lined with cilla that sieve small particles, mainly phytoplankton. There are no respiratory organs, heart or blood vessels. Instead, zooids absorb oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide through diffusion. Gymnolemata are soft versed shaped or calcious box like zooids and the stenolemata have tubular zooids. There are three orders of marine bryozoas, the centostomata, the, where the exoskeleton is typically gelatinous, are composed only of a soft membrane, therefore it is non-calcified and soft to touch. Celiostomata have calcified box-shaped zooids with a mouth like a trap door. They are crispy to touch, and Silostomatida are difficult to identify in the field, but form calcified tube-shaped or cylindrical zooids. Bryozoas, which are filter-feeding animals, can be difficult to distinguish on the seabed from hydros, which are stinging sessile animals, and some soft coral. Bryozoa. I have placed the three orders of bryozoa in each row. Each row contains three example species. The order Stenostomata has a non calcified vase shaped zooid that is soft to touch. In the first row, we have the Vesticulari spinosa, sea chervil, and jelly bryozoan. Vesticulari spinosa looks similar to many hydroids due to its feathery nature, and the jelly bryozoan could easily be mistaken for an encrusting sponge. The order Celiostomata is a calcified box-shaped zooid that is crispy to touch. 
some of these bryozoas are more easily identified. For example, the CMAT bryozoa is often found on kelp leaves. CMAT is a favorite food for nudibranchs. And so when you have found CMAT, do look for nudibranchs. Similarly, the incorrectly named Ross coral, which is slowly correcting its name to potato crisp bryozoa, is pictured center. And the middle right is the aptly named monkey puzzle bryozoa, looking like a South American monkey puzzle tree. The order Silostomatida is an animal containing calcified tube shaped or cylinder zooids. Many cyclostomes have encrusting colonies firmly cemented to hard structures such as rocks and shells. They usually grow as subcircular sheets, spots or pimples or spreading branches. Most erect cyclostomes develop bushy colonies with narrow forking branches. Bryozoa and hydroids can be easily mistaken on the sea bell amongst other animals. And when we have this unidentified mixture of animals, we call this mixed turf. Eucaria animalia chordata. Chordates of three subphylum. Number one, the vertebrates of craniata which include tetrapods and jawed vertebrates. Two, cephalochordates, which include lancets or microscopic free swimming animals. And three, tunicates. Here we consider tunicates and in the following slides, some vertebrates. You may not have heard the term tunicate as these animals have the common name of sea squirts. Tourniquets can be very beautiful when you look at them close up. Colonial tourniquets may look like some bryozoas or even some sponges, but are more related to the jawless hagfish and lampreys because in the juvenile state, tourniquets are free swimming. Also, some unitary uh, sea squirts can be difficult to distinguish from bivalves having only their siphons visible. There are three classes of tourniquet, but we are only interested in ascidians, as the other classes are largely pelagic. The body has an outer a protective covering, the tunic, which contains a cellulose-like substance. Sea squirts have two large pores, one to guide water into the body cavity, the oral siphon, and the other serving as an exit, or the arterial siphon. Water is propelled through the animal by cilla in the throat. Food and oxygen are taken from the water current as water passes through gill slits in the branchioli basket. All are filter feeders except a few carnivorous deep water ones. Sea squirts are hermaphrodites as they possess male and female reproductive organs near the gut or body wall. The tourniquet life cycle. The colonial species fertilize with each other by shedding eggs and sperm into the sea. Larval forms have, the, have a tail with a notochord and a nerve cord resembling a tiny tadpole. These tadpoles have a simple eye called an ocellus and swim by undulating the tail. These larval reach sexual maturity within a few weeks. The larval tourniquets attach themselves to this hard surface using an adhesive mechanism on their heads. In about three to four days, the tail, eye, brain and notochord are absorbed leaving only a small mass of nerve tissues. The body and siphons, as well as digestive, reproductive and circulatory, or circulatory organs, soon develop. Chordata tunicata. I have placed the three orders of ascidians in each row, and each row contains three example species. In the first row, we have the Apollosobranchia. These are colonial sea squirts identified by having simple throat baskets. 
In the top left, I have the carpet sea squirt, which is a highly invasive, non-native marine animal that can threaten conservation, fishing and the shellfish industry. It has been identified in harbours in Wales and sightings should be reported to the Marine Biological Records Centre in the UK. Top middle is the Apolidum punctum and top right is the transparent with silvery detailing light bulb sea squirts. In the second row we have the Phalebobranchia. This is a colonial and solitary sea squirts that typically have longitudinal vessels in the throat basket. Middle left we have the largest UK sea squirt which is the Phallosia mammillata which is about 10 centimeters high. Uh, center the Ascidia mentula and middle right is the quite gorgeous uh, gas mantle sea squirt. In the third row we have the um, Stotolidobranchia which are uh, both colonial and solitary and they are identified by having the presence of a folded uh, throat basket. So bottom left we have the star ascidian, uh, bottom middle the orange sea grapes and bottom right the leathery sea squirts. To note, uh, unitary sea squirts can reproduce sexually. Colonial sea squirts can reproduce both sexually and by budding. Colonial sea squirts can be stoliferous. This is connected at the base, but look like a collection of individual tubes or compound where they have a large mass of oral siphons with the arterial siphon connected to a common larger opening, opening called a, a cloacal. Lucaria animalia cordata. Vertebrate fish can be challenging to identify as there are many species and I've only listed a few on the following slide. It is worth noting the classification at the level of class as there is quite a separation in taxonomy. The classes are 1. Agnathia or Craniata and it is those species that have no jaw which may also indicate little or no vertebrate, such as the hagfish that only have a skull, or lamprey. 2. The chondrichthys is a cartilaginous fish, like a ray or shark, and the osteichthys and the vast majority of fish are bony fish, such as wrasse or Atlantic cod. Other marine vertebrates are in the class, for example mammalia, and these include seabirds, seals, porpoises, whales, but these are generally easy to identify. Chordata vertebrata. Let us examine a few examples of fish. Elasmobranchia is one of the two subclasses of cartilaginous fish. Members of the Elasmobranchia subclass have no swim bladders, five to seven pairs of gill clefts opening individually to the exterior, rigid dorsal fins and small placoid scales. The teeth are in several series. The upper jaw is not fused to the cranium and the lower jaw is, is articulated with the upper. Signathiforms. These fish have elongated narrow bodies surrounded by a series of bony rings and small tubular mouths. The shape of their mouth allows for the ingestion of prey at close range via suction. Several groups of signathiforms live among seaweed and swim with their bodies aligned vertically to blend in with the stems. The most defining characteristic of this order is the egg husbandry method, where the males house eggs in an osmoregulated pouch or adhere eggs to their tail until the eggs reach maturity. Luffy forms. 
like the monkfish, are a species of anglerfish. They are carnivorous and thus adapted for capturing of prey. They range in colour from dark grey to deep brown. Deep sea species have large heads that bear enormous crescent shaped mouths full of long fang like teeth angled inwards for efficient prey grabbing. Osteichthyes. The vast majority of fish are members of the Osteichthyes, i.e. bony fish. The group Osteichthyes is divided into the ray finned fish and the lobed finned fish. On the bottom rows are examples of bony fin fish, including gobies and blennies, which don't have swim bladders. And an aside is that the blennies have a continuous uh, dorsal fin running the length of the body, while blennies have a split dorsal fin. Eukarya animalia nodaria. Anthrozoa is a complex and complicated area and classifies anemones, corals, sea fans and sea pens. In the subphyla of Anthrozoa, we have the classes Hexacorellia and Octocorellia. The Hexacorellia have six or fewer axes of symmetry in their body structure, which allows it to be distinguished from Octocorellia, who have simple unbranched tentacles that normally number eight or more. From the table we can see that hard coral are a part of hexacorellia and soft corals are classified as octocorellia. Octocorellia also contain sea fans and sea pens. This means that hard corals are more related to sea anemones than they are soft corals. There is confusion around dual anemones not being anemones. Dual anemones belong to the Corallimorphuria order and are more uh, closely related to stony or reef building corals than they are of true anemones. So should they be really called dual corals? So to clarify, what is the difference between coral and an anemone? Corals are different from anemones because they have a skeleton of sorts. Anemones are squishy and basically filled with water. Corals create a hard skeleton, however small, of calcium carbonate. Phylum Noderia, Anthrozoa, class Hexacorellia. Let's have a look at a few examples of class Hexacorellia, showing five different orders. In the top row, we have Serenthiaria which is a tube anemone, an example of which is the burrowing anemone. Zoanthiaria, which are colonial anemones, and examples of which are the sandy creeplet and the ginger tiny anemone. In the middle row, we have the truest sea anemones of the actinaria, and we have uh, pictures of the sandaled, trumpet and imperial anemones and in the bottom row we have the Corallimorphuria, which are knobbed tentacle anemones and we have a dual anemone in the picture Sclerinactinia, which are hard corals and we have two pictures one of a devonshire cup coral and the next of the sunset Cup coral. Phylum Nodaria, Anthrozoa, class Octocorellia. Let's have a look at a few examples of Octocorellia showing the four different orders. In the top row we have the Alconacea, which are soft corals, and we have examples of the red fingers, pink sea fingers, and dead man's fingers. In the middle row, we have the uh, Gorgonacea, which are the sea fans, and we have examples of the pink sea fan, the northern sea fan. 
and to the right of the middle column we have a Stoloniferia, which are Stoloniferians, and we have only one in the UK called the Cerveria Atlantica, found only off the Dorset coast and can grow 20 millimetres tall. In the bottom row we have the Penatulacea, which are sea pens, and we have the tall sea pen which can grow two meters tall, the slender sea pen, and finally on the bottom right is the phosphorant sea pen. Eucaria animalia nadaria. In the Medusozoa we are interested in three areas, the hydroidolinea, scyphozoas and storozoas. I have also added on the bottom Saturnophora or comb jellyfish, which are not jellyfish despite the name. Hydroids. Hydroids are very small predatory animals. Some hydroids are solitary and many colonial. The colonial hydroids have multiple polyps connected by tube like hydrocoli. Where the hydrocolus runs along the substrate, it forms a horizontal root-like stolon that anchors the colony to the bottom. The colonies of the colonial species can be large. One in particular can be dangerous in the UK, which is the Portuguese man of war, a siphonophore. There are a number of classes of jellyfish. There are no box jellyfish in the UK. These species can be very dangerous, but are typically found around the Indo-Pacific area. The UK has only six types of true jellyfish, and if you are lucky, you might be able to spot the sessile, stalked jellyfish. Polypodizoa is a parasite that attacks the eggs of sturgeon and similar fish and lives inside the cells of other animals and is not considered in this presentation. There is a little understanding of zooids required in the subphylum of Medusozoa. There is typically two types of zooids which can either be a single unit or form a colony of zooids which act as a single unit. The two types of zooid are polyp. In the hydrozoa, um, they have polyps with tubular bodies with their mouth surrounded by tentacles at one end. The other end is blind and usually acts uh, attached to a foot-like disc on a solid seabed. Polyps are generally sessile and they reproduce asexually. Meduse. In the Scyphozoa, a medusa has a ball or umbrella shaped body with tentacles around its margin and a mouth centrally located under the lower concave surface. Medusas are generally mobile and they reproduce sexually. Phylum Nerduria, Medusozoa, class Hydrozoa. Let's look at a few examples of class Hydroidolinea showing the three different orders. Anthrothiacata hydroids generally consist of polyp heads called hydrinths growing at the tip of a stalk or hydrocallus. Some tentacles are adopted for feeding, oral, and others for defense, aboral. Reproductive structures or sporosacs develop on the hydrinth. Leptotheocata hydroid colonies show a variety of growth forms. Colonies may take the forms of one or more stems that support many polyps, which are called hydrotheocae, or polyp bearing branches called pinnae. Colonies may compromise single stems, bushy tufts, or branched fond like structures. 
To note, colonial species of hydroids generally show two polyp zooid forms. First, the dominant form is the feeding polyp. These are arranged in regular fashion within the colony. Second, the colonial hydroids may become modified for other purposes, such as defense and reproduction. On this second reveal, we can see the reproductive spore sacs. Although a siphonophore may appear to be an individual organism, like the Portuguese man of war, but each specimen is in fact a colonial organism composed of medusoid and polypoid zooids. Phalamnaduria medusozoa. Let's look at a few examples of jellyfish and comb jellies. There are not many species of jellyfish in the UK. We have six true jellyfish, all of which are mobile. We also have a few types of sessile stalked jellyfish. Cyphozoans usually display a four part symmetry and have no head skeleton, specialized organs for respiration or excretion. Marine jellyfish can consist of as much as 98% water. Cyphozoans have a ring of muscle fibers present within the umbrella structure around the rim of the dome. And the jellyfish swims by alternatively contracting and relaxing these muscles. The mouth underneath opens into a central stomach from which four interconnected tentacles radiate outwards. The tentacles burst stinging nematocysts along with cells that secrete, secrete digestive enzymes. Starozoas or stalk jellyfish have a trumpet shaped body with a stalk and a number of branches or arms within the tentacles on the end. Eggs are spawned and form creeping larva. The larva crawl around until it finds a suitable spot on the rock or algae. The stalk jellyfish also practices asexual reproduction by splitting their body into new individuals. Most species are found in cold water close to the shoreline. Senatophores, which is Greek for comb bearers, have eight rows of comb or, or fused cilla arranged along the side of the animal. These cilla are able to split the light and hence offer rainbow colours along its length. These cilla beat synchronously and propel the senatophore through the water. Senatophores are not Nadarians, with which they share several superficial similarities, as they lack stinging cells, and instead, in order to capture prey, senatophores possess sticky cells called coleoblasts. Eucaria animalia in canadams. Looking at the echinoderms phylum, we have a number of subphylum which should all be recognisable. Astrozoans, which are starfish, brittle and basket stars, they are characterised by a star-shaped body plan consisting of a central disc and multiple radiating arms. They usually exhibit a five-star radial symmetry, but some species have a symmetry based on numbers other than five. Inchinosaurs have a body that is or was originally a modified globe within episodal symmetry. Inchinosaurs are commonly identified as sea urchins and sea cucumbers. Crinozoas, which in their adult form are attached to the sea bottom by a stalk, are commonly called sea lilies. But they are only seen in very deep water while the unstalked form are called feather stars. 
Cryozoas are incredibly beautiful, but are often overlooked by divers who consider them more plant-like. Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Echinoderms. Let's have a look at a few examples of the Phylum Echinoderms, showing the five different classes. Asteroidea, or starfish, have a water vascular system that supports its body and helps it to move about and feed. At the end of each arm, or ray, is an eye spot that can sense changes in light. A starfish's tubed feet can also sense or taste chemicals, water currents, and feel objects around them. Starfish have mouths that face downwards and are opportunistic omnivores. Ophiurodea, which represents brittle or basket stars, has a body outline similar to that of starfish, in that ophiuroids have five arms jointed to a central body disc. However, in ophiuroids, the central body disc is sharply marked off from the arms. The central body contains all of the internal organs of digestion, reproduction, which never enter the arms as they do in the asteroidea. Holothuridea, or sea cucumbers, are marine animals with their leathery skin and an elongated body. The mouth is surrounded by a ring of tentacles, which are usually retractable into the mouth. These tentacles can greatly vary in size. Sea cucumbers are found on the seafloor or jammed into tight crevices. Echinonidea, or sea urchins, have a spherical hard shell or test, which are spiny. Sea urchins move slowly, crawling with tubed feet and also propel themselves with their spines. Although algae are their primary diet, sea urchins also eat slow-moving sessile animals. Crinodea, or feather stars, mouths face upwards towards the surface and possess a somewhat cup-shaped body and five or more flexible and active arms. The arms which have feathery fringes can also be used for swimming. Feather stars use their grasping legs, called cirri, to perch on sponges, corals or other substrata and feed on different drifting microorganisms. Eukarya, Animalia mollusca. In the phylum of mollusca, we had the subphylum of Testeria. Polyplacphora, or commonly called a chiton, is an unusual creature found generally from a line between North Wales and Yorkshire to the north. And they have a segmented shell like a woodlouse, but instead of legs, they have a foot like a limpet. Bivalvia are a class of marine and freshwater mollusks that have laterally compressed bodies enclosed by a shell consisting of two hinged parts. Scaphalopods, which are tusk or tooth-shaped shells. The gastropods are a very interesting class that cover slugs and snails. Marine snails include species such as cowrie, periwinkles, whelks and painted top shells, to name a few. I had thought all slugs were called nudibranchs, but when you investigate this area of taxonomy, you will find that some marine snails, like the sapsucker, are not in fact nudibranchs. The last species of mollusk is the most intelligent, the cephalopods, which are octopuses, cuttlefish and squid. The cephalopods are bilaterally symmetrical, with two eyes and a beaked mouth at the centre of eight limbs. Octopi have a relatively short lifespan of two to three years. Octopus lifespan is limited by the reproduction as they go into successence after mating, where the octopus does not feed and eventually dies. Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Mollusca.
The taxonomy in the area of gastropods has been in a large amount of flux in recent years and is therefore an interesting area of research with much classification ongoing. So let's have a look at a few example classes of mollusca showing the six different orders. Polyplacphora or chitons have a shell comprised of eight separate shell plates or valves. These plates overlap slightly in front and back edges and yet articulate well with one another. Because of this, the shells provide protection at the same time as permitting the chitin to flex upwards when needed for locomotion. Bivalves vary greatly in overall shape. Some, such as cockles, have shells that are nearly globular. Others, like razor shells, are burrowing specialists with elongated shells and a powerful foot adapted for rapid digging. And we must not forget the native oyster, Ostria edulis, that is under ever-increasing environmental stress. The oyster population has declined around the UK at an alarming 95% over the past 200 years due to historical overfishing, disease, pollution and loss of its habitat. It cannot be overstated the importance of healthy filter feeding by valve beds. In the middle we have the Caernos gastropoda and contains many families of shelled marine mollusks, including the cowries, whelks, painted top shells and periwinkles, with this class constituting about 60% of all living gastropods. On the bottom row, the area of sea snails is quite complex. I have shown three sea snails from different taxonomic classes commonly found in the UK. Firstly, the Sacoglossa, uh, and there is a picture of a solar powered sea slug or sapsucker. This Sacoglossans uh, simply digest the food which they suck from the algae and use it with their own tissues, living chloroplasts, hence using energy from the sun. Secondly, the Anaspedia, and we have a picture of a sea her. Their color corresponds to the color of the seaweed they eat. This camouflages them from predators. When disturbed, a sea her can release ink from its ink glands providing an opaque toxic screen. Nudibranchs are a group of gastropods that shed their shells after their larval stage. They are noted for their extraordinary colours and striking forms. Their eggs are usually white in a gelatinous spiral ribbon and are protected by toxins obtained from sponges. The lifespan of nudibranch can range from a few weeks to a year depending on the species. We will consider all three phylum of worms within this slide. Platyhelminthes is a phylum of relatively simple bilateral symmetry, segmented, soft body invertebrates. They have no specialized circulatory and respiratory organs, which restricts them to having a flattened shape to allow oxygen to diffuse into the bodies. The digestive cavity has only one opening for both ingestion and excretion. As a result, the food cannot be processed continuously. Nemity is a phylum of animals, also known as ribbon worms. Most ribbon worms are very slim, usually only a few millimetres wide. Ribbon worms have a foregut, stomach and intestines that run a little below the midline of the body. The anus is at the tip of the tail and the mouth is under the front. Nemateans generally move slowly and use the external cilla to glide across surfaces on a trail of slime. Annelids are more complex worm than the previous two phylums and is far larger group with over 22,000 species. 
Annelids, also known as segmented worms, with segments that are divided by shallow ring-like constrictions called annuli. Most of the segments contain the same set of organs, although sharing a common gut, circulatory system and nervous system makes them interdependent. Most annelids have closed circulatory systems where the blood makes its entire circuit via blood vessels. Three phylum of worms. Let us have a look at a few examples of the three phylum of worms and I will focus on the polychaetes within the phylum annelids. Platyhelminthes. There are a few flatworm species in the UK with the most common type being the candy stripe flatworm. This has an elliptical shape with a rounded front end and a more tapering back end. It is flattened with an undulating wavy margin, which is formed into a pair of tentacles at the front end. Often this flatworm is confused with sea snails. The two are not closely related and this is a flatworm and not a mollusk. Nemity. There are only a few ribbon worms in the UK, two being the football jersey worm and the bootlace worm. The football jersey worm has a rounded head and a firm cylindrical body gradually decreasing in diameter to a blunt tail. The colouring is very distinctive. The long bootlace worm may grow to typically between 5 and 15 metres, but are usually only 5 to 10 millimetres in width. The body is brown with lighter longitudinal stripes. Its mucus contains a relatively strong neurotoxin, which uses as a defence against predators. Polychaetes. Most marine annelids are polychaetes or bristle worms. They have a pair of external bristles or paripodia, and they're used for locomotion. Their mouths vary depending on their diet, since the group includes predators, herbivores, filter feeders, scavengers and parasites. Most polychaetes have separate sexes. The fertilised eggs hatch into plankton larvae. There are many different forms of polychaete worms, which is a study in itself. Eucaria animalia porifera. Much research is underway within this phylum, and hence you can find contradicting taxonomical trees as reclassification is ongoing. Let's look at this phylum of sponges and discuss some of the classes. Calicera are characterized by small modular structures made out of calcium carbonate of the form calcite or argonite. They are small, measuring less than 10 centimeters in height and drab in color. Calcera sponges varies from radically asymmetrical vase shaped body types to colonies made up of a meshwork of thin tubes or irregular massive forms. Typically, these calcareous sponges are found in shallow tropical waters. However, there are 29 species recognized in the UK. Hexatine lelida, or glass sponges, are relatively uncommon, and they are typically in deep water and found in all oceans of the world, although they are particularly common in the Antarctic and Northern Pacific waters. Demonspongia are sponges with a soft body that covers a hard, often massive skeleton made of calcium carbonate. Due to long life, 
500 to 1000 years, analysis can be formed on them similar to the rings of a tree to determine environmental marine conditions. Larger skeletons can look like reef corals, hence called coralline sponges. There are 334 species recognised in the UK. Homo scleromorpha, or simple encrusting sponges, are exclusively marine sponges that tend to encrust on other surfaces at shallow depths. These sponges typically inhabit shady locations, overhangs and inside caves. There are four species recognised in the UK. Eukarya animalia porifera. Let's have a look at a few examples of the porifera or sponges in the UK. Demospongia represents the dominant class of living sponges, representing more than 75% of those alive today. Few of the demisponges have hard skeletons. Demisponges can range in size from a few millimetres to over two metres in size. They can form thin encrustations, lumps, finger-like growths or urn-shaped structures. Pigment granules in the amoeba cysts often make members of this class brightly coloured, including bright yellow, orange, red, purple or green. Homo scleromorpha. These sponges are massive or encrusting in form and have a very simple structure with very little variation in the fine calcium spicular structure. Calcareous sponge is characterized by skeletons composed entirely of calcium carbonate spiculars which are internal needle-like structures. Calcareous sponges mainly occur on rocky bottoms in temperate shallow waters. They're usually dull in color. Detailed classifications of plants and chromisters to the phylum level. Eucharia plantae. Within the kingdom of plantae, we are interested in three phylum that occur in the marine environment. These are the chlorophyata or green algae, which have chloroplasts that contain chlorophyll A and B, which means they reflect a bright green colour. The cell walls of green algae usually contain cellulose and they store carbohydrates in the form of starch. Green algae requires lots of light and hence divers find them higher up in the water column in the supra or upper littoral zone. Most rhodophytes or red algae are a marine plant with a worldwide distribution. Divers often find red algae at greater depths compared to other seaweeds. Typically, chlorophyll is poor at absorbing green light in order to make energy. Red algae contains an accessory protein called phycoblins that help absorb more green light, which reach these deeper habitats. Hence, red algae have adopted to live in the deeper infralitoral zone. Not all marine plants are algae. Tracheophytes are plants that have evolved a plumbing network called a vascular system that allows them to transport nutrients from roots to leaves and vice versa. Zostra or eelgrass is one of these few marine grass species. Optimization of light energy in water by seaweeds. We need to talk about light absorption and reflection to understand the evolution of the seaweeds. From the first picture to the left, we can see the solar energy distribution and it is represented by the yellow curve. 
with the presence of different gases in the atmosphere like ozone, carbon dioxide and water vapour, light energy is absorbed differently at different wavelengths of the spectrum, as indicated by the jagged spectral density curve. When this light energy reaches the sea, the denser water will have greater attenuating effects. To the right of the slide is a figure describing how light is absorbed in the water column at sea. The red light is absorbed first and the blue or ultraviolet light is transmitted furthest into the deep. So we now have a competitive light environment for plants. Those that require high energy, particularly reds and infrareds, need to be, need to be near the surface. And those that absorb blue can live further down the water column. We have also noted that those that require high energy light, like green algae, reflect green light strongly. This means that this reflected light could be used further down the water column. There are many types of chlorophyll, A, B, C1, C2, D, and new ones being discovered, such as chlorophyll type F. From the middle diagram, we see that chlorophyll A and B absorb red and blue light, but is poor at absorbing green, which it reflects. Hence, the C in temperate zones, like the UK, appears green. Red algae has chlorophyll A and no chlorophyll B, but it also uses an auxiliary pigment called phycoblins to absorb more of the blue-green light that gets through, and hence red algae can sustain life further down the water column where there is less competition. It is also noted that when red algae is nearer the surface, the same plant will often look less red, as more energy is being generated by the chlorophyllis A. It is also noted that as the light reduces further down, this is where the filter feeding animals are, as they have less competition to the substrates and hence there will be a greater percentage of hydroids, bryozoas, anemones and sponges. Plantae, chlorophyata. Chlorophyata or green algae are classified as plants. Their colour is due to the chlorophyll A and B, which are the same pigments as found in the land plants. Green algae range in size from the microscopic species to the macroscopic species, such as green sponge fingers, Cordium fragile, which grows up to half a metre long. Identification of many green seaweeds to the species levels is difficult. The green seaweeds exhibit an extremely wide range of morphologies and examination of microscopic features is often needed in order to distinguish species. Some species are morphologically indistinguishable and require molecular techniques for identification. Many species of green seaweed grow attached to various substrata, including rocks, pebbles, seaweed, wood, and man-made structures from the high intertidal to the shallow subtidal zones. The habitat in which you find the species can give an important clue as to its identification. Tracheophyata. Zostomarina. This species is not an algae, but is the most wide ranging marine flowering plant in the Northern Hemisphere. It lives in the cooler ocean waters in the North Atlantic and North Pacific and in the warmer southern parts of its range. It can be found in bays, lagoons, estuaries, on beaches and in other coastal habitats. 
Zosta marina occurs in calmer waters in sublittoral zones where they are rarely exposed to air. It's, uh, it is anchored via rhinosomes in sandy or muddy substrates and its leaves catch particulate debris in the water which it then collects around the base of the plant building up top layers of seabed. Plantae Rhodophyata The characteristic blue-purple colour comes from pigments that occur in the most ancients of algae. This allows the absorption of blue-green light. The red seaweeds are the oldest known seaweed group on Earth. They are related to the green algae, so they are classified as plants. Most red seaweeds around the UK shores are small and require a high-powered microscope or even sectioning, in the case of crust-forming species, in order to arrive at a correct identification. Red seaweeds nearly always grow attached to a substratum and occur from the high intertidal zone down to the deepest part of the photonic zone. Different species thrive in different habitats, including kelp forests, bedrock, boulders, mobile cobbles, pebbles, and sand scoured habitats. Eucharia chromista octophiata. Octophiata is a phylum that contains Paeophysia or brown algae. Brown algae has been classified in the kingdom of Chromista and not Plantae. There is much debate, but the thinking is. Scientists believe brown algae only recently developed, 150 to 250 million years ago, while red and green algae have been in the similar form for about 1 billion years. Red algae being amongst the oldest fossilised records on, on the planet. Hence, while brown algae developed from a similar unicellular group of heterocons as red algae, the development has been in parallel to the lineage of red and green algae and not with it. The main difference in morphology between the red, brown and green algae is that green algae contain chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B and xanthophyllis. Red algae contains chlorophyll A, chlorophyll D and physurethin, while brown algae contains chlorophyll A, chlorophyll C, and fucosanin. And with regards to storage of energy, green algae stores energy as emulsio or emulsopectin starch. Red algae store food in the, in the form of fluoridine starch and brown algae stores it in the terms of maninol, manitol or laminarin starch. Needless to say, brown algae are a major seaweed of the temperate and polar regions. They are dominant on the rocky shores throughout cooler areas of the world. Octrophyata pheophysia there are many types of brown algae in UK waters and they all have a similar structure. To name the parts of the structure of brown algae. The body of all brown algae is termed a thallus. A hole fast is a root-like structure present at the bottom of the algae, but unlike a root system in plants, a hole fast serves only to anchor the algae in place on the substrate where it grows. A stipe is a stalk or stem-like structure present 
in the brown algae. It may grow as a short structure near the base of the algae, or it may develop into a large complex structure running throughout the algal body. Many algae have a flattened portion that may resemble a leaf. This is termed a blade, laminea or frond. Some brown algae have gas filled floats called pneumatocysts to help provide buoyancy many kelps and members of the fucalis to help the algae raise nearer the surface and thus receive more light for photosynthesis. Historically in the south of the UK, kelp was abundant along the Sussex coastline, but this important habitat has diminished over time, leaving just a few small patches and individual plants, mostly in shallow waters and along the shoreline. There is presently a Sussex kelp restoration project to help bring it back. Next steps, marine identification to individual species. Within this presentation, I have developed the taxonomy and classification marine tree of life across all phylum we expect to encounter in UK waters. In doing so, I have already looked at 140 examples of individual species we might likely see in the UK. I have also outlined some of the invasive species we'd prefer not to see in the UK. This talk has offered a decision tree, maybe a complex one, that shows how to get from the broader descriptor to specific species. Many of the guidebooks will be mapped to the level of phylum, especially when they're dealing with all marine species in an area like the UK. Many guidebooks will describe a small taxonomical area like sponges and then develop and discuss the individual species in greater de detail and hopefully this talk has put those more niche texts into the larger picture. However, as the subject matter of marine species is so large, even these excellent detailed guides will still only address a finite amount of species and certainly none of those species waiting to be discovered. This talk should have helped you to mind map across the species you will encounter on the dive, but also to help you mind map across the chapters within the guidebooks and internet resources available in order to help you with identification of marine species. On this slide, I have placed the guidebooks I use and find very useful. Most are based around the Sea Search organization. I have placed on this slide some of the online resources I have used to help my learning and identification of marine species. But what I would like to finally comment on is how to put this knowledge into practice. So how do we apply this knowledge out in the field when we go diving? The most likely response is with some difficulty. But let's solve the problem. As with all complex problems, we need to start to break the problem down into manageable chunks. And we need to determine at what level of detail do we require to satisfactorily answer our question. For example, do we wish to know the phylum we are looking at? or identify the individual species. One of the first steps in your process of solving marine identification is to simplify your problem space. Therefore, before you go diving, learn a little about the habitat you'll be diving in. You will not find eelgrass or ragworm on a high energy cliff face. Equally, it is unlikely to find lobster or jewel anemone out on muddy plains. Do a little bit of research on the actual dive location before you go. For example, have a look at some previous UK sea search reports or 
find some local knowledge of the area and become familiar with the likely species you might see. Go diving. Utilize the knowledge you have gained from this talk, but quickly you'll find that it's not enough. This is when diving with a camera becomes beneficial. So most marine identification is performed after a dive. Talking with others or thumbing through guidebooks and online resources. For you to start this guess the species conversation, you'll need an accurate image of what you have seen. My personal camera setup is a 60 meter housing for a compact that I bought off eBay at the cost of £22 and separately I found a camera to fit it for £6.50. This also means I have the added bonus that if my camera floods I will not be in tears. Adding light to your subject when taking pictures always adds to success. The next best thing to take clear pictures is good buoyancy and trim. We don't want to touch the surrounding seabed as we'll scur the critters and cause low visibility. The types of equipment you'll need will start to become optimised for what you want to discover. For me, a cheap camera is enough. Fellow divers use magnifying glasses, expensive cameras with macro lenses for those minute ghost shrimp and if we have a particularly difficult species to identify then we might need species samples or possibly a small microscope or even a big one and of course access to the experts. Conclusions so let us briefly conclude what we have covered. I aim to build knowledge on top of the BZAC Marine Life Appreciation course, offer an understanding of why we classify, examine the history of taxonomy and classification, showed how taxonomy and classification works. We developed the broad classifications at the phylum level for the marine environment. We then worked the detailed classification of animals, followed by the detailed classifications of plants and chromisters, and then we looked at next steps. I hope you have come away with a better understanding of what you can see when you go diving. So this is the end of the marine identification, taxonomy and classification. And I'm Stephen Winstanley.